In today's video, I'm gonna show how we create the titanium sidewinder chainstay yokes. We start with a plate of grade five titanium. This is 6.4 titanium. I got two of these plates like this. So I need to saw this up into a bunch of little blanks. Then we'll load those into the Haas milling machine and we'll cut these nice shiny parts. Uh, it's a ride along, uh, strap in. This right here is the automatic horizontal bandsaw. It's a horizontal bandsaw because you lay the workpiece horizontally. It's automatic because it actually, it'll make a cut that it'll pick up again and it'll feed the bar and it'll make another cut. It'll do that over and over again. And you can set the number of pieces that you want. And then down there, there's actually a dial and you can set the cut length that you want. It's pretty awesome. So let's get this thing set up. I have both plates loaded into the vices here and they're not tight yet, or, well, they won't be tight. Let's see. Flip that one up. Flip that one up. Now, now I have these plates here and I can slide them back and forth. And what I, what I wanna do is I wanna drop the head of this down. Now that I dropped the head down, I gotta get rid of this foot. And now I can slide the plates against the bandsaw uh, blade so that it's just kind of lightly touching. And now, now I can clamp the vise hydraulically with this switch. And I can lift the saw up out of the way. This foot here, uh, it basically allows the saw to detect when there's material so that as it's rapid dropping the saw, it doesn't crash this blade into the workpiece, but uh, it locks out some of the features. So for setup, you need to be aware of how this functions. Now that I have it clamped and lifted up out of the way and I am uh, clamped on this front vise, now I can slide that second vise toward us and I can uh, set my cut length. Just set my cut length to 3.9 inches. So now, now I can manually feed the cut forward. All right, there we go, it's sawing now. This will take a little while. The purpose of a chainstay yoke like this is for on a titanium bike frame, and this one really is designed for a hardtail mountain bike. Let's say you have a you know 2.4 inch tire, or I don't know what it is, some bigger 29er tire maybe, and then you have probably like a single chain ring, and uh, there's a limited amount of clearance uh, really between the tire and the chain ring where you can fit your tube. And uh, if you have like a 7 8 tube, like a lot of titanium builders want to use, it's hard to actually bend it just right and smush it enough to make it fit in there. So you might use a chainstay yoke and you would weld this to the bottom bracket shell and you'd weld this little stub end to the chainstay. And then this here would take care of that, that narrow, it's like threading the needle in between the two. And uh, this is a half yoke. This goes on one side of the bike. And because it's grade five titanium, you can weld it to the other tubes and uh, it's, it's plenty thick and strong. That's the warm up cycle on the mill is done now. And uh, yeah, so I mean, we offer this off the shelf. It's just, it's like pre-mitered on both ends basically. So it makes fabrication really easy. In order to machine those chainstay yokes out of titanium, we need sharp carbide cutting tools. This is an end mill. It's a five flute 
It's pretty good for cutting titanium. This particular one is kind of half worn out. I've used it on steel and that dulls the edge enough that uh, for cutting titanium, you really want very sharp cutters. So I have a brand new one. And because this is a shrink fit tool holder, I actually have to use this induction heater to heat it up and it swells the tool holder, which is tool steel. That heats up faster than the carbide. You can remove the carbide end mill that's worn and you can drop in a new one. And then as this cools, it, it grabs really well. And so uh, let me demonstrate that process. It's pretty neat. So you can buy induction heaters for shrink fit tool holders and uh, they cost a fortune or you can get kind of DIY, which is what I did years ago. And honestly, it works pretty well. So I have my, uh, my sort of welding gloves or you know, heat resistant gloves. I'm gonna try not to touch anything hot. Then I have my carbide end mill. I'm gonna save this. It's not really that worn out. It's just not sharp enough to make perfect titanium parts. And then I've got my other end mill ready. And there is a backstop inside of this tool holder that's adjusted correctly. That's really gonna help us uh, get it to the correct depth in there. So I turn the system on and now I can hear it's working, the uh, power supply, and it'll take, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds here to heat up this tool holder to the point where it's gonna release this tool. So I'll wait a couple seconds and then when I feel like I'm about there, then I'll start trying to tug it out. The name of the game is don't heat it up any more than you need to. Now, uh, the carbide doesn't particularly get hot from the induction heater, but these pliers would. Anything that goes inside of the ring there, you can hear it load the power supply actually. There we go, that's it. Turn the heat off as soon as that comes out. Then I push this in against the stop and all I gotta do is just wait. Yeah, it's already frozen, I can feel uh, when the tool holder is swelled large enough to fit the end mill, then, uh, then I can spin it. But as soon as it shrinks down and, and kind of freezes the tool holder in place, uh, you know, it's tight. So I just hold it against the backstop. There are vapors and gases and things inside of the tool holder body that can expand and push the end mill out. So, you know, it's good to hold it in there until it kind of freezes in place. We have the tool in the tool holder and I need to establish the length of it. So I, uh, I'm going to use the probe here. This is the roto vise. This is a four station vise we're going to use to hold these parts for operation one. I Got them all bandsawed up to size. And you can see the rotary, this rotary fourth axis allows us to orient the part multiple different ways and to hold four different parts all in the same space. This thing is pretty transformational for what you can do with the machine. And it's a really good way to hold raw stock because these jaws have serrated grippers. So you can hold it just by a very small portion and you can leave most of the block exposed uh, to the cutting tools.
So we just ran some of the operation one on this roto vise. You know, we're grabbing the raw stock and we're doing machining operations, but we can't finish it on this fixture. And so uh, what we need to do is we need to switch the whole roto vise here uh, for this purpose built second operation fixture. So, uh, you know, we have some of the geometry and some of the features cut into the part and those will be gripped now by this fixture, which has these really complicated shapes and little hold downs uh, so that I can actually hold the part and finish them. So this will do four at once. I built this fixture so that it could do eight at once, but I usually only do four at once. I'm going to switch these out. This thing is heavy. Now that I have these four parts loaded in the OP2 fixture, I can just run this program. Uh, you know, I could put eight parts on this fixture, but uh, the tool life of the end mill, I'm not getting enough light. It works out pretty good actually to do uh, four on the first operation and four on the second operation. So that's how I've been running them. Uh, if I get the volume on this up, like from a sales perspective, if I get the volume up, then that'll encourage me to solve this problem. But uh, so far it's been you know, a relatively niche product. So this works really good actually.